Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome on behalf of the whole Citrix Ready as well as NVIDIA team. I'm delighted to bring you a very exciting webinar today. We've got a joint customer with NVIDIA and Citrix, City of Corona, and we have two great gentlemen on our webinar today. We'll be talking about how they've used a combination of NVIDIA and Citrix technology, and I'll introduce you to them real quick. We also have a moderator for this webinar, Constantine and he'll help you drive the conversation and provide you some insights into how NVIDIA and Citrix is coming together. Uh, before we get into that, just a few housekeeping details. This webinar is being recorded and all of you will receive a recording in the next 24 hours. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A panel on the GoToWebinar platform and keep typing in your questions. We'll answer them as we can and there's also a formal q a session in the end and the questions that are relevant to the entire audience will be taken up there i do want to spend a quick minute on uh, citrix ready some of you may have already attended the citrix ready webinars uh, these is a series of webinars where we bring together partners and technologies that have integrated with citrix and what that means for our customers this webinar in specific is very special where we're bringing on our customer to really talk about how they are using our technology. Obviously, there, there's an array of technology integrations that Citrix has done with third-party technology companies. If you do want to explore those, all of those are available at citrixready.citrix.com. We're also running a promo on this webinar. So every 10th attendee on this webinar will receive an Amazon Echo Dot device applicable only to US and Canada for now, unfortunately for logistics reasons. And please stay through the webinar and I'll tell you how to claim your gift uh, at the end. At this moment, let's get into it. Let me call upon our moderator, Constantine, uh, to take it from here. Constantine, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Rubal. And uh, thanks everybody for joining our webinar today. Uh, this was a webinar that I was honestly really looking forward to um, because the best sessions are, are, are truthfully the ones that feature uh, customers and companies that um, can share with you uh, their their journey to digital transformation, uh, adoption of different technology, uh, responding to uh, different crises and different situations in the field. Uh, so I was really, really excited about this webinar. Uh, a quick uh, word about myself. Uh, I've been with the company, for, with NVIDIA, actually, for about five years now. Uh, I've been working with uh, the pub with our public sector team, enabling our customers uh, to uh, adopt and implement uh, GPU accelerated computing. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, NVIDIA and GPUs uh, more at length uh, later. Uh, but I've been with NVIDIA for five years. Um, however, uh, interestingly enough, I like to say that I was born and raised at Citrix because Citrix is where I actually uh, started my career. Uh, I was part of the uh, tech support team. I was part of the uh, escalation support team. So I worked for a number of years at Citrix and I uh, uh, really remember my time there fondly. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, to feature our speakers today. Uh, one of them is from Citrix as well. A uh, huge advocate for uh, NVIDIA technology and, uh, and, and for uh, cust uh, Citrix customers at large. Uh, so today I'm gonna bring in a couple of speakers. Uh, one of them is Chris McMasters. Uh, he's the uh, CIO at uh, City of Corona, California. And I'm going to let Chris introduce himself as well. Uh, the second speaker I'm going to invite is Kyle Edgeworth. He's the deputy CIO uh, at City of Corona. And they're going to do most of the talking. So I'm just here to ask your toughest questions to them and really get out of the way uh, to let our speakers uh, really give you uh, their insights and their information and knowledge that they've accumulated over the years uh, in adopting uh, cloud uh, technologies, GPU accelerated technologies, and really uh, kind of walk you through their entire journey that hopefully is going to help you uh, as you're looking at uh, moving to the cloud, as you're looking at adopting uh, things like GPU accelerated computing, uh, cloud computing with Citrix. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, they will serve as a great example for you in, in, in your own uh, sort of infrastructure journey. So uh, with that, Chris, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and invite you to speak and please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Constantine. So I'm Chris McMasters. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the City of Corona. Um, 
I've only been really in Corona and in government for about six years. Before that, I spent 17 years in the private sector, also as a CIO. Um, so it was a huge change for me and a little bit as a paradigm shift in the way that I thought, but also in helping government change and shift that paradigm as well. Um, my principal job really with the city is strategy and vision when it comes to technology. And we were an enterprise part of the organization. So we, we touch all parts of the city. The city itself is a full service city. So we have police, fire and utilities. Uh, we serve about 160,000 people and we're a little bit east of Los Angeles. So if you don't know where we are, it's, it's about uh, an hour or so east of Los Angeles. So thank you. Thanks, Chris and uh, Kyle. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for having me. So yes, I'm Kyle Edgeworth. I'm the uh, deputy CIO for the city of Corona. Uh, like Chris kind of mentioned, uh, I've been with the city just under six years. And like Chris, I came from the, the uh, private sector as well. Uh, and I handle the day-to-day -day operations for our city and we handle, we're a full service city. So I handle all the uh, police, fire, public safety, um, public works, Department of Water and Power, et cetera. All that falls under me and for the daily operations and uh, everything else Chris kind of mentioned. So I'll just leave it at that. Awesome, thanks Kyle. Um, Calvin, would you like to come on, on camera? Sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Calvin Shu. I am the VP of Product Management at Citrix. Um, and in five days, I'll have spent 18 years at Citrix, um, been through uh, lots of different iterations, lots of different product names. So I, I date all the way back to, to MetaFrame for those of you in the audience that are, are, are um, um, you know, old time colleagues of ours. Um, and uh, I lead the team that, um, that uh, builds and, and you know, creates a strategic roadmap for our VDI and for our desktop as a service solutions. So very glad to be here and, uh, and to the, you know, the city of Corona folks. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to speak about your, your, uh, your scenario and your case um, with a number of customers in public sector and not. And, and throughout the pandemic, it's, it's been a real inspiration for people and really, really informative for them to be able to see what you've done and, and go read the case studies and, and uh, you know, follow you guys. So, so thanks for being a part of this. Calvin, it's funny how we attach our, our, our careers at Citrix to a specific timeline of products, right? So you mentioned MetaFrame. Does that mean you were not there for WinFrame? I came in after WinFrame. Yep, I don't have the WinFrame shirt. Not the WinFrame. Okay, I came during presentation server, so there you go. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, I want to welcome uh, my colleague uh, Vishal uh, from NVIDIA. He's our senior director. Um, he's going to give you guys a lot of insights today on, on how we enable our customers for uh, GPU acceleration. Um, but Vishal, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself as well. Jack, thanks, Constantine. And, and uh, you know, just like you, I, I have roots at Citrix. So I spent the last 20 years at Citrix, um, actually working with Calvin and, and a good friend, Calvin, a lot, and talking about VDI and DAS and secure access technologies. And I, I joined NVIDIA. Um, in the enterprise product group as a senior director of product management, um, helping our customers um, understand AI and how they can use it. And really our goal is to enable um, AI to be really easy and uh, you know, enable them to use it in their enterprise and, and do the, all the automation work. So really looking forward to today's webinar. Perfect, thanks Vishal. So before we dive into it, um, I just wanna ask Chris and Kyle, is there an ongoing joke about the city of Corona, the name, you know, is there something there that you guys have, have been picking up in the last couple of years? Could, could be, yeah, it could be. We get we get confused a lot of times. So first, when I first got to the city, it was with Corona beer. And uh, yeah, after that, shortly when the pandemic started, yes, yeah, so we became the virus capital, it sounds like, of the nation, so. <laughs> we have seen a large influx in our uh, web traffic in the last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. So, so today I'm sure people are going to know how the city of Corona outsmarted Corona, right? That's that's really the point of this whole of this whole webinar. Uh, but in terms of the city itself, um, I believe it's a pretty sizable, isn't it? About 150,000 uh, people population. How big yeah. is your IT? How big is your is your IT staff? Um, about 30 people, about and about half of those are part time. So it's not it's not a very big staff, and I think that sort of speaks to why we're talking today about the technology and how we're able to leverage that. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a lot of people per per staff head. Um, I must say. Um, so 
Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you first, right? Um, because your digital transformation started several years ago, actually uh, before the pandemic, right? So there's a lot of there's there's been a lot of research being done by various market research organizations about how companies, how organizations, how agencies have responded to uh, COVID-19 and the way it shifted, um, frankly, people's workspace, how people connect to their workspace, uh, how people uh, stay safe and are able to work from home. Um, but I believe that um, you guys had plans in place already, uh, you know, prior to that, uh, to really leverage cloud technologies and hybrid cloud. So uh, what were kind of the some of the motivations and justifications, both from a business standpoint, because I think there's going to be a lot of people on the line uh, on your level, Chris, that are going to want to know uh, the business side of it, uh, as well as as well as on the technology side, um, what kind of motivated you to go that route? And maybe just um, give us an introduction to uh, to your environment, right? What's the scope? What's the size? Uh, what does it look like? Yeah, sure. So I, I think when we started, um, it was it was a very big paradigm shift. Everything was on premise. You know, when I got to Corona, um, backing up, you know, our systems and our redundancy was a mile away. So so if there was an earthquake or something in Southern California, which is highly possible, um, you'd basically shatter our network. Um, and so we didn't have any type of true business continuity, you know, outside of our geographic area, and that that posed a problem. So I think that at the beginning, that was the the first sort of reasoning behind, like, okay, this is why we need to go to the cloud. This is why we need to push out because we don't have that type of continuity within the city if something was to truly happen to us. Um, but also, I think the other part was when when I came in and when Kyle came in shortly after was there was a wealth of ideas, like of fresh ideas of coming in and how we could change government, all these, you know, maybe more radical things to do, but we really didn't have uh, the ability to do that at, you know, at speed and to deliver. And we also didn't have the culture, you know, around it to be able to do it. So, so part of it was in, in our transformation was to help the organization understand what we were about to do, but also to develop an underlining platform, right? So that we could do all of these things and do them quickly um, without, you know, a massive set of resources in the background that we had to pull from. And so cloud technology was really the answer for that in a lot of ways. So it really started out with like network and server infrastructure, you know, at the beginning, and then we moved, you know, into the virtual desktop space. Um, and then it just collided really at the right time when the pandemic hit, right? We were, we were ready to go at that point. Um, so that helped us a lot. But I'll let Kyle kind of talk about maybe the more granular things. Yeah, so for us, you know, cost at the beginning was a large factor um, in looking at why we would transition. And it's funny to say that because, you know, you think of the cloud, you don't think necessarily cost effective. But in our case, we were looking down the barrel of a large expenditure to get our infrastructure in such a way where it was up to speed and we can actually utilize it for the agility and other purposes that we needed and the redundancy. Um, and so we looked at different models. And for us, going from a CapEx model to an OpEx model, actually made sense, especially in the government space. Um, and so for us, when we're looking at like BDI, especially if we were looking at the CapEx model, I mean, that was gonna be a million plus dollars just to get that infrastructure. And for us to be able to spin up, you know, VDI for a couple hundred dollars, I mean, that was drastically different um, and our budget was able to accommodate that. And for us, it gave us that redundancy, the resiliency of geo redundancy to move out, uh, the ability to scale up and down. And I think a lot of people in the government also understand that purchasing can be challenging and so and a long drawn out process and the cloud gave us the ability to kind of scale on demand uh, which very that helped us a lot when it came to you know covid uh, and so for us that was that was the factor that really allowed us to scale adjust and um, transform gotcha and and how did how did your users respond to that um, how, first of all how did you effectively communicate uh, the transition to your users and how did they react and what were some of the challenges maybe that you, you ran into during that time at the at the beginning um users didn't know what we were doing to be honest because we're just moving the back end people didn't need to know what we we're doing uh but then when we started to transition people's or the employees desktops to the cloud that's where the communication really needed to come to the forefront so we had a lot of people that we reached out to that were um, champions and allowed us to work with them on developing that product because we worked hand in hand with Microsoft and with Citrix trying to get the cloud PC 
developed. Um, this was back five plus years ago. Uh, and there were some challenges along the way, but as we worked through those, a lot of our, our employees were looking at it saying, well, what's wrong with my desktop right here? It's just sitting right here and I can touch it and I can turn it on, I can turn it off. Well, why would I need it? And so we had a, um, a challenge trying to educate our end users as to why it was important for us to move to a cloud model of desktop and a, as well as our infrastructure. Um, but with the pandemic, that really educated people quickly on the need for such an infrastructure. And that really allowed people to understand our vision uh, better than we could ever you know, elaborate or tell them about. Um, and from that, once people understood it, they were able to use it, get their hands on it, they were able to work from home, um, people weren't being laid off or, you know, the government, in our case, our city never shut down because the employees just went home and logged into their desktop. It was, it was a seamless transition for the end user. And once they understood that, they understood they could work anywhere, anytime from any device securely, that helped adoption just grow substantially. Great. And um, I'm just curious, did you... Did you guys already have uh, virtual desktops in place on premises and you just moved them to the cloud or were you going from a physical desktop to a virtual deployment completely on the cloud? No, so we went straight to the cloud. Sorry, Chris. Uh, we went straight into the cloud. Uh, we, we didn't have anything that was already in place. And for us, the infrastructure cost to do that on-prem uh, on for VDI was just too substantial for us to, to stomach. And so we were able to go straight into the cloud. And I think that allowed us to really transform a lot easier because we didn't have that already legacy infrastructure in place. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, I just, it wasn't without bumps though. I mean, I, I think, you know, once we flip the switch, right, there's lots of things that spun up at the same time. And the pandemic being the catalyst for that, I think there was still a lot of cultural change that had to happen. Government, you know, in general, like in the private sector, right, a lot of people work hybrid or they work fully remotely. And in the government, almost no one does that. And so, so shifting kind of this idea that, okay, we could, we can move operations outside of city hall or outside of the police department or all these other places, which were so 100% ingrained on doing things on premise was also kind of a major cultural shift within the city itself, right? And learning how to do that. So the technology was a factor in it, but I think what the technology did is it just, it allowed us and enabled us to do that, you know, fairly easily without a lot of, you know, pushback because they knew it was secure. Um, they knew that we could deliver agnostically, regardless of your device, right? We didn't have to provision all these things, you know, to go out. Um, and it was fairly smooth because it's just on demand, right? We're spinning them up as they need them, you know? So it's not, it's not a lot of, of back end work, I guess, on the purchasing side and procuring and doing all these things, right? It was literally like turning on switches, giving people a link and away they go. Gotcha. Let's talk specifics. Um, what is your deployment? look like today uh what what applications are you guys using uh of course uh, uh let's let's bring in uh, calvin as well from citrix um i'm curious about which part of the citrix stack are you using today um in the cloud um are you mixing uh, virtual apps with virtual desktops are you are you are you doing any type of rdsh or is it pure vdi because uh, I know we have a lot of techies on the line and they manage those deployments on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm sure they would like to know. So I'll just answer the very high level part of that, which is we have, you, if you can imagine a workload, we're probably doing it in some shape or fashion. I think that, you know, the thing with cities is like ours, for instance, right? We're mid-sized, but we have 22 departments and they span everything from, you know, the librarian who's having to use a desktop to the engineer who's having to do CAD, right, on that same desktop, which requires a lot of GPU power to push. So you name it, we probably do it. And because we're a full service city, there's also varying degrees of security that go along with that. So, you know, some of the challenges that we had, for instance, was getting DOJ approval, you know, to make sure that we were CGIS compliant with a lot of our stuff. And, and that's not an easy lift. It's a very different lift than what you do in the private sector, you know, for different things. So from my point of view, it's, it had to encompass all of that to really support city functions. And we pretty much do every type of workload that you can imagine. Um, and I'll let Kyle kind of go with that a little bit. Yeah, so piggybacking on that, uh, I mean, you have everything from office workers to power workers to GPU usage. Uh, they're running NVIDIA in the cloud, um, in our case, in the Azure Gov stack. Um, they're running everything from Esri on a GPU to full AutoCAD. Um, and actually, ironically, when we had our public works, a couple of them that were utilizing it during COVID, they're working from home 
and one guy was on a five-year-old laptop and he was running full CAD in a Citrix desktop. And he said, this is running better than I did in the office. And that was like a testament to me. It's like, wait a minute. I mean, you're, you're on an old laptop and you're running full CAD without any, any issues. I mean, that's, that's better than it was before. So that was a testament to me that the technology worked and it worked well. Um, but the other thing that we're, we've done, just talking on a, on a high level, so we decoupled the hardware from the endpoint. So for us, that's using, using the technology of Citrix Cloud to do that with their DAS solution, so desktop as a solution. Uh, we are using some remote desktop, or sorry, um, some remote apps as well as part of that solution. Our desktops are mainly, they're all encapsulated, of course, so we don't have any data that comes in and out. They're non-persistent desktops is the way we went, um, specifically for uh, ensuring that it was secure and that if there was any malicious software that was downloaded, it was erased the moment the person logged out. Because of that, we're utilizing software like FS Logix to help the user feel like it's a persistent desktop, but it's not. Um, and then we're utilizing technology like Citrix Analytics to allow us to understand how the user experience is, because that is important. We, you know, a lot of times it's the, I, I feel like it's going well, but is it going well? And the Citrix Analytics really lets us understand the user's experience that's going on. And Chris touched on it too, because of the CGIS compliance as well, we do run a Citrix ADCs as well in the cloud, but we do have that running for the FIPS encryption component that is CGIS requirement. Um, I would love to, uh, to make the statement, Kyle, that your CAD desktop was working perfectly because of the GPU. However, um, I know how important it is the, uh, the, the remoting protocol itself. So Kevin, what's the secret sauce uh, Citrix uh, formerly ICA, uh, then HDX, right? Um, I see it over and over and over again in, in high-end uh, 3D professional visualization environments. Uh, it's an absolute winner. Uh, the integration with uh, our virtual GPU technology has been uh, amazing. It's, it's, it's really the first protocol that we've been integrated almost a decade ago. Um, but, you know, I'll let you fill in the gaps there and kind of how all the different pieces of the Citrix solutions fit together to make that experience as brilliant as Kyle just described. Yeah, it, and it's amazing to think that it it, it was uh, about a decade ago that we you know, first got the the first VGPUs. I remember you know the whole launch experience happening and and customer events where we were both announcing it. Um, and uh, it it it's really just become a cornerstone, I think, of um, of people's end user experience and of use case expansion and of security. Right? Um, uh, you know those uh, designers and the folks that you're talking about working with those models. Um, they no longer have to, you know, carry around hard drives or push large files over the internet, right? Like they can keep those things in a centralized place and, and access them um, remotely. Uh, from a secret sauce, well, you know, some of it's secret, so I can't, can't tell you, but there's a, a large portion of this that I think um, comes from our heritage in having supported end users that are on less than stellar networks and in very remote locations. Um, and also from having to do this from a CapEx model to start. And the reason I say that is because um, in our focus, when we started supporting the vGPUs and developing HDX 3D around this, um, it was not just to say, hey, let's give the best performance. We said, we have to deliver outstanding performance, but it has to work on a variety of networks, right? Whether they're you know, the, the top end corporate enterprise networks, or if it's an ISP going to someone's home. Um, not only that, but on the back end, you know, we need to be as conservative and, and as efficient as possible in the amount of um, consumption of the resources that we're using. Um, you know, how can we optimize both the GPU, or the CPU, the overall compute um, that, that's sitting in, in, in the back end and minimize what's needed on the endpoint. So that overall, the entire solution uh, can you know, be cost effective, uh, that it can be deployed widely. And when you're doing those workloads in the cloud, you know, you're you're optimizing the use of that pay-as-you-go consumption in the cloud, and, and I think that's a really important part of of how the the protocol has developed and, and how we partner with Nvidia to make sure that these solutions really, um, really you know deliver the goods for for folks like Kyle and Chris. Thanks, Kelvin. I'm glad you you ended there with Nvidia because I do see a person with an Nvidia shirt uh, on the video, <laughs> Michelle. Um, what are what are your thoughts on on, on some of the use cases that uh, we like to refer to as kind of low-hanging fruit for NVIDIA. Obviously, later on, we're gonna talk about kind of what the future holds, some of the emerging technologies, but 
What are you seeing today as primary use cases um, for GPU accelerated computing, uh, whether it's in the data center, specifically in the data center, uh, in the cloud as well? Uh, obviously, our GPUs are everywhere, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts on, on the use cases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it's it's funny because when we did start this integration work, I was on the other side and actually using some of these GPU cards, Maxwell-based cards, plugging them in Dell servers and trying to make this tech work 10 years ago. And it's amazing how ubiquitous this technology is now. I mean, we have now 50 plus public customer case studies and customers ranging in all industries, whether you are in energy sector, healthcare, finance, manufacturing, public sector, every every industry, every vertical is now utilizing the, the GPU technologies to accelerate their workloads. And, and the use cases are um, all the way from your regular use um, office workers to high-end designers. Because if you go out today and try to buy a laptop or a desktop, 99% um, of chance that it will come with some kind of a graphic card in it. And if you look at just the basic Microsoft Office technologies or Edge browser or Chrome, it actually performs way better with the GPU thing and with the GPU technology. So, so it's very natural. If you want a local-like experience, if you want that native physical experience, so the end users can't tell the difference or better, like in Kyle's case, when he says, this actually runs better um, than my local, then you do require the GPU technologies. And what we have done is, as Chris was talking about, really working hard to make some of the use cases like disaster recovery and business continuity possible, right? I mean, on a desktop, if it is a failure, it fails. Um, in the cloud or even on-prem with live migration uh, technologies, you can actually really migrate you know, your workloads from one machine to the next machine and really even address use cases around business continuity and disaster recovery. And then finally, and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, what we are seeing is not only are the customers using this for your applications on 3D side like Autodesk and Katia and SolidWorks and Esri and all those things, but more and more around artificial intelligence. And GPU turns out um, to be amazing, amazing technology uh, for AI and ML because it's, uh, it can parallelize all these things and do them together. And, and just accelerating the compute and performance and enabling AI everywhere is what the VGPU technologies is really doing. And the software which NVIDIA is building on top of it, uh, which is the NVIDIA AI enterprise software, which you know, gives you computer vision, NLP, or recommendation systems, all those things customers can really use and accelerate their journey um, in the cloud or on-prem um, using GPUs. So that's a nutshell and I can go on in forever, but I wanna give Chris and Kyle more chance to talk about what they are doing. Yeah, Vishal, just, just, just one more thought there. And I guess one additional question is, um, there are a lot of folks on the phone that are already using vGPU technology for all the obvious reasons that, that you talked about, um, but they've kind of been always on-prem. Um, how, can, how can customers take advantage of virtual GPU technology in the cloud? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, so we, we work with all major public cloud providers to make sure our, you know, our technology is available um, in the cloud. So like Kyle and Chris are actually using it today in Azure, right? And, and, and there are VMs available with the vGPU and all you need to do is choose the right kind of a VM um, and the vGPU license type. And it's as easy as to get started in the cloud. It's actually easier in most cases to get started in the cloud because then GPU is available on demand. You really don't have to think about the supply chain constraints in most cases and wait for the right card to arrive in your data center, plug it in or wait for the OEM vendor to ship you the right hardware. Yeah, and that's a great point uh, the, about the ease of using the cloud because uh, full disclosure, obviously virtual GPU is a licensed solution. Uh, we've put a lot of development uh, efforts into it. Um, however, in the cloud, you can launch an instance that's already pre-bundled uh, with the vGPU driver stack and with a license. So you don't even have to worry about deploying an NVIDIA license server. You can certainly bring your own license, but uh, if, you're, if you're doing a complete uh, Greenfield deployment, 
you can actually just launch a, a, a vGPU back instance in the cloud and it'll just run uh, without the need for additional right. like, components right. right yeah so it's uh, and um, uh, turn it, turning over back over to uh, Chris and Kyle um, specifically on on the Microsoft Cloud and Azure obviously they're not the only provider but what was the motivation behind choosing them over say some of their competitors I think at the at the time it was they were the only one, frankly, in the state of California for us that met all the compliances that we need. Um, obviously, that's changed now. Pretty much every all the major platforms, you know, meet those same requirements. But when we were first starting out, like it was it was very slim pickings on what we could, you know, who we could select based on our security requirements. So I think that's what drove most of it. Gotcha. And and the integration, I know that it's the name has changed several times, but I believe it started as Windows Virtual Desktop and then it became Azure Virtual Desktop. Is that also part of, of your solution stack? Yeah, well, I mean, we can we explore lots of different things. I mean, we use Citrix predominantly, um, but we also we've we've tested and and used multiple different kinds. Same thing with even our at the uh, at the endpoint, right? Everything from from zero clients to all the way up to stack. So we've we've slice it a bunch of different ways and it works different ways for different people is what we found but we've always utilized the back end has always been azure so it's always been windows virtual desktop or then now it's azure uh, virtual desktop but yeah we've always utilized that stack and and citrix is just providing that front end ease of use for our end users gotcha. yeah I, I i figured as much i thought it was kind of a a combination of of all of the above um Kelvin, um, it's when we talk about the Azure stack, are you seeing, what are some of the trends that you're seeing with customers that are deploying Azure? You mentioned that uh, there is a, it's, it's almost like a desktop as a service offering. Can you speak a little bit to that, to, to the DAS aspect of it? Because that also assumes that there is a management sort of component to it, right? Um, can you speak a little bit to DAS? Sure. Um, well, I think I'll start by keying off of something that Chris just said. Like it, you know, it works differently for different people, right? And they have different uh, different needs, different use cases. Whether it's the endpoint or it's the amount of compute or the GPU on the back end, um, and I, I think that is really um, you know the the core to our strategy and, and core to the why you know we love working with customers like like City of Corona and that there, there's this sort of recognition that there's not a one size fits all. Um, that, uh, you know, even as you say, you know, you've been using Azure and they met your security requirements at the time, there are other clouds that have done that now. So maybe other people will make different choices. Um, and, uh, and also, as you talked about, like the, the, the whole CapEx to OpEx thing, do I start in the cloud? Do I start on-prem? Um, many of our customers were on-prem at the time that the, ha the, the pandemic hit. And, uh, and so, you know, their easiest, fastest, best quick way to hybrid work or remote work was to expand their on-prem data centers, or um, even in the case of like the, the the 3D work, I see some of the exact opposite scenario where instead of you know having started on-prem and putting um, you know and then trying to move those workloads to the cloud, they, they have a on-prem solution that is very much RDSH based. It's task worker kind of thing, and then um, to access the GPUs, they go to the cloud, and, and so that's how they they decided to, um, to put those workloads out there. Um, and so what. Our job is really, and particularly with desktop as a service, is how do we enable people to have that flexibility and take advantage of those capabilities as quickly as possible with as little of their own sort of management and maintenance of the Citrix stack, the Citrix infrastructure as possible. Um, and so that's really what the, the Citrix um, desktop as a service is built around, is that idea that, um, that our, we run, we operate the management infrastructure components, right? The databases, the brokers, um, the consoles, uh, updating of, of those elements. Um, and we kind of offload those from the customer so that you can get directly to the use cases, figuring out which user needs what type of desktop and they need a certain type of application, what kind of experience do they need, or what security policies do I have to configure? And we give you all those tools, but we're running the, the infrastructure um, on the back end. And, um, really freeing you up to make those business choices about how to deploy um, versus spending so much time thinking about how to deploy the Citrix infrastructure. So it almost sounds to me like you can have a multi-cloud strategy 
that also includes on-prem, right? So you could have your management plane managed by Citrix, but at the same time, the virtual desktops can still be on-prem, correct? For Absolutely, yep. that, are, that are considering the hybrid cloud scenario, for example. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that the workloads can go anywhere. They can go into, you know, we have a an Azure GovCloud presence as well for, for folks that need that. So they, whether it's a, so a high security um, cloud or any, you know, public cloud or private cloud or data center, um, you know, that, that choice is the, the customers and, and based on their business requirements. We support them all. One, one of the first thing, one of the things that I really like about Microsoft uh, is, as far as um, adoption of, of, of BGPU technology is the fact that they were actually the first CSP to adopt fractional GPUs. So now we have uh, A10 backed instances in the cloud. So before what I was seeing a lot of was Yes, 3D environments in the cloud, but a lot of RDSH because financially it didn't make as much sense to have a single user session in the cloud because you were getting basically an instance with an entire GPU in pass-through mode, right? And it was a little bit cost prohibitive. Uh, Microsoft actually uh, one of the first CSPs to, to introduce fractional GPU. So now you can go into the cloud and, and really create single user sessions, true VDI desktop experience for high-end 3D graphics uh, users in a much more cost-effective way. Uh, so I think this is, is pretty transformative, in my opinion. And Constantine, if I can jump in for a second. Uh, in the government space, that's not necessarily there yet. Uh, at least in our instance, we're not able to access those. So what we do use is Windows multi-session. So with Windows multi-session, we're able to have multiple users all on the same GPU sharing those resources across us. So that's how we are able to leverage that while reducing the cost in the cloud as well. That's a perfect point. Um, so Chris, uh, back over to you. Let's uh, let's talk about the future. Uh, what are some of the uh, the workloads that you're seeing on the horizon, um, and some of the uh, sort of emerging technologies that that you guys are starting to take advantage of? Things like um, uh, data science, uh, machine learning, uh, onboarding, those type of workloads that may require additional compute power that, uh, of course, uh, uh, NVIDIA can provide uh, both hardware and software. So I, I have some uh, slides we can share real quick just to kind of give people a visual of some of the things that we're doing today, and then we can talk a little bit about what we're doing tomorrow as well, right after that. So let's see if, uh, if I could get the rights to share. Let's see here. You have them now, Chris, go for it. Thank you. Just bear with me for a minute. Now, when you can see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. All right, let's hide. Let's see if I can hide this. There we go. All right, this is by far just a very small snippet of some of the things that we're doing um, kind of in that space, especially utilizing AI architecture um, and AI architecture in the cloud which I think that's probably been the biggest thing for us besides you know, just the virtualization of our environment. It's really been um, enabling people to do things that we normally could not do. We don't have the staff, nor do we have the computing power to do it. Um, and so it sort of democratized that type of technology for us and allowed us to do, I think, big things without the same staff you know, and without the same footprint that normally you'd have to have for some of this stuff. Um, this is a really simple one. So this is an AI chatbot, you know, that we developed, and it's probably in its fifth iteration at this point. Um, it's gotten smarter and smarter, I think, as we've, as we've gone along. It uses um, a lot of AI technology to interpret it's sort of the conversational AI component of it. Um, can speak in different languages. Um, can lead you through all parts of our website, and then it's smart enough to know when to when to transfer you to a real person as well. So it's. It's a lot of um, technology wrapped up in that. And again, this is something that as a team of 30 people, right, with half of which are, are part-time, we couldn't do this on our own, you know? And so we're, we're leveraging, um, you know, both vendor and, uh, and AI type technology that can be consumed in a way that we couldn't have done before. before. Um, this is a project that we worked on. Again, this is using sort of AI in the cloud type technology, but understanding um, citizen sentiment, you know, throughout the community. So it's it's sort of like it's listening in on all of these conversations that are going on through social media, um, and through all of our channels, but also just sort of listening within the same ge the geographic area of Corona, 
taking all of those things, helping us catalog them, and then looking at that conversation again and helping us understand, you know, are they happy? Are they, is it sort of a neutral conversation? Are they angry with us? And how can we then direct that to departments to kind of get ahead of situations? So this is sort of using AI to understand customer sentiment. And, and here's, so I'll give some examples in the public safety space. So this is stuff that we've used sort of an Esri backend engine with their AI, which again is utilizing uh, NVIDIA GPUs and it's understanding crime within our city over sort of that space time continuum, right? Where is it, where is crime occurring over time and where are those hotspots emerging when we start using some predictive analytics against it so that we can take our limited police resources, right, and disrupt those, those areas and those things. Um, so this is sort of a visual representation you can kind of see and um, we brushed all the data and then it started showing us where those hotspots were and where they would soon emerge. This is another example of that, right? This is sort of crime over time. So you can, you can see by this, it's which street shouldn't you be going down at which time of the day, right? Where are you most likely to have, have something happen to you, right? And so we can actually look at those. It gives us some predictive analytics around that. And then it helps shape how we police, right? So it's, it tells us a lot about what's going on in the city. And again, we can, you know, this is crushing hundreds of thousands of references, you know, through our CAD and through other systems and compiling that all together, layering it um, in a way, and then using that AI technology to interpret it all. This um, is really, really fascinating. I know, yeah, I, I got to this. Is, I love this stuff. So, AI, so this is AI for, uh, for road conditions. So this is a pilot that we did with road biotics. Um, this is in the map of our particular city, but what it does is you, you literally put like the cell phone in the work truck and people drive around or you can put it on your street sweeper or your trash, you know, uh, that's going through and it is looking at those roads and using visual AI to interpret the condition of the road to tell you where there's a pothole and then it reports all of that back so that we can send out our teams or interface it with our work order system so that it can automatically dispatch someone to go fix that road or fix that sidewalk um, you know or that pothole and get it filled so again just a really cool technology and then this one what's that oh. i was saying that these are all you are way ahead of the curve i mean i, I get to talk to a lot of customers in public sector and this is really really fascinating and inspiring to hopefully customers listening that this is now truly possible uh, with the power of AI and GPU and DAS in the cloud now. And yeah, and that's workloads. And I, th I think that's why like, I'm so excited about it is like a shop of our size, we would never be able to do that without the technologies that are available today, that it's become so democratized that we can do these things, you know? And I don't, I don't have a staff of people just working on AI. We, we can't afford it, frankly, or those people and the individuals. So it's given us this ability to do really great things and let our ideas come to life because we have access now to these things at a, at a cost effective you know a cost effective way so here's yeah, a, this I mean, is another one. Oh, sorry i just want to add just one thing is this is exactly the goal is to democratize ai and build all the models and pre-train them and make available to our customers whether they're like people net to identify people or pothole detection ones or um, a tree falling down on the road to yep. like they're all computer vision but natural language processing models and we have like Riva and Merlin and Maxine models where you can just take them off the shelf these AI models now run yep. them on the NVIDIA GPUs and you can do both data or all the three things actually data science training and inferencing the reason you want to do that on a GPU versus CPU it's like 10x faster that's like mind-blowing like inferencing on a GPU versus CPUs so this is possible today customers like you are doing it today so this is super exciting stuff yep <laughs> so th this is an example of us doing this is the fire department this was actually just presented at the esri conference uh, just a month ago but this is again like how do we utilize our limited fire staff to perform inspections and how do we know where we should be doing those inspections frankly so we took just this massive amount of data from a bunch of our different systems right and and went through this process where finally we let the AI sort of um, take a look at it and tear it apart for us, right? And weighed all the different variables together to give us an understanding of where fire inspections need to occur. And so, you know, right now we have that. We have basically a fire risk index that we can use and go out 
and get get kind of the most for what we're doing? Where's it going to make the greatest impact? You know, unfortunately, like things like this were developed because there was a loss of life, right? We we there was inspections maybe that weren't done in a timely fashion, or we just weren't focused because we were literally, you know, just quadranting the city out and just going quadrant by quadrant versus taking all this data, crushing it down and understanding where we could best be, you know, utilizing that to have the greatest impact with the population. So the, that's the type of things we're able to do, you know, going kind of through this because again of that democratization of, of AI technology that the GPU brings. So I will, uh, I'll stop. Chris, are you, um, are you um, guys sort of starting to mix the two together in a sense that uh, this type of deployment, for example, is it is it at all part of the uh, cloud environment or is this completely separate? No, uh, it's, because... yeah, it's it's all really one thing, you know, when it comes down to it. And even if we're d dealing with multi-cloud sort of environments, right? The nice thing about this is that it, it allows accessibility to all of our staff to these types of technologies and be able to leverage them, which again is like something that would have been impossible back in the day, like because we, we wouldn't have the infrastructure to do it, you know. And then during the pandemic, I mean, you could even buy a computer, right? You couldn't do any of this. And, and to this day, right, it's still very tough. So we still have that accessibility because all of it's sort of cloud-based. We buy exactly what we need for the time period that we need it. Um, and then we, we leverage it that way. And to add on to that, we're utilizing things like big data in the cloud where we're connecting all these uh, disparate systems together so we can get that holistic view for what the data looks like. And then we can do analytics on top of it to actually take um, assumptions off of that, what we need to do from there. And I'll, So we I'll utilize add. the cloud specifically for that. We have to do that because without the cloud, we couldn't have we couldn't have ever done that. You, you asked kind of like what's coming next, right? So I'll, I'll answer it really, really quickly because I know we're out of time here. Um, so we're, we're using, we're, we're right on the cusp of using AI to, to affect traffic right now is kind of what our thing is. So if you live, if you live in Southern California, you know where Corona is because it's called the Corona crush, because it takes literally like an hour to go like five miles, right? In Corona and you just crawl through it. And we can't really control necessarily the freeways, but what we can control is the impact it has to sort of residents within our city. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're going to take all of all of the data that we get, which is usually done by engineers, right? And they they calculate things, and it takes them a long time to do this. But we're going to take all this visual data that we have from all of our traffic cameras throughout the city and all of our cameras throughout the city, and going to be able to aggregate that to basically in real time adjust all of our signals. So if there's an accident in one part of the city or one one ramp or on the freeway, right? We can automatically adjust and it will adapt. To that environment to give the best throughput for all of the main arteries in the city and so that's that's one of the big things we're doing another thing is is leveraging that also for public safety so taking the, you know other services like brief cam and adapting ai to sort of our camera infrastructure right for crime and those sorts of things um, taking our eoc for instance which uh, your emergency operations center in a city usually when there's a disaster right that's where everyone sort of congregates well, we learned in the pandemic that we don't want everyone to congregate there when there's a disaster in the city. So how do how do we take something that that has traditionally always been on prem, right, and disperse that? And we were able to do that using kind of our the VDI technology, right. Um, but what we're doing now is we're we're taking and adapting our our physical infrastructure so that they work best with um, oh sorry with with our virtual environments so that it'll be seamless in the future. So that I think that's kind of a, a huge thing. And I think the last thing I'm gonna squeeze in there is that really what we're after at the end all is changing the way that government works. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's not just the democratization of technology, but also how it applies to citizens, right? And, and in digital government. And so how can we take government so that you don't have to stand in line at city hall, so that it is convenient to you, right? That it's not, it's not eight to five and you have to take a day off work to go get a permit, you know, or to deal with the, with the government to get something done, right? The, how do we change that model? And to me, fundamentally, like the work, the remote work strategy changes that model, right? Because effectively we're able to hire people now who don't have to be in our city limits, who could be anywhere, right? So it opens up this entire different workforce and it also allows us then to serve the community in a much different way, right? Where government can operate 24 seven, where government can be, and meet you wherever you want to be met. So whether that's a digital inspection where we don't have to come to your house or whether that's you know 
asking for a permit and we can get that permit done at eight at night when you got home, right? Those, it changes the way that government works fundamentally. And that's really what we're after. And that's what I'm so excited about with these types of technologies is it opens the door for all of those things that, that eventually come and work with the citizen, right? It makes your life better and it makes government work better for you. All right, that's my two cent pitch. <laughs> <laughs> it was an excellent pitch, I must say. Um, and, uh, and, and it also frankly comes down to dollars, right? Uh, Vishal, uh, I remember we had a success story about uh, potholes, in fact, uh, with the city of Kansas uh, not too long ago, where they had uh, this massive backlog of, of emergency potholes, right? And it was costing them a lot of money. Uh, so they, they put a, what they ended up doing is they put a, a, a ballot initiative uh, up, up for voting to add additional funding uh, for specifically for infrastructure to enable artificial intelligence and uh, it ended up paying for itself over time uh, so they were kind of really pioneers in, in that space as well um, I, think but, I, I would like I know yeah. we are we are almost close to time so if there is a takeaway from my side is to encourage everyone who's listening on the call is to check out the NVIDIA AI enterprise websites and the launchpad websites too pick up these pre-trained models. I mean, AI is accessible to everyone now. And you pick them up, use graphical tools like Tau Studio to just modify the models, train them to your data and deploy them, um, either using DAS technology or GPUs in the cloud and see the magic. Like, you know, this is, this is truly possible now. And um, there are so many different models around natural language processing build your own conversational bot like Chris and Kyle did, or build computer vision applications or recommendation systems. Um, uh, the technology is getting there and, and I highly encourage everyone again, just AI ML whitewashing is done. There are practical use cases available now. Um, it's up to you to do some research and then whatever you do is up to your imagination. Yeah, absolutely. and and. And, and, and I should also mention that uh, one, of the, one of the trends that I'm seeing in our sort of traditional end user computing environments, uh, whether on-prem or in the cloud, is the addition of those new and emerging workloads to your enterprise infrastructure, right? So what I mean by that is, let's say, uh, customers where we've traditionally been deploying, um, let's say, virtual GPU for uh, high-end graphics, right, for CAD and CAM applications uh, and CAE applications. Uh, we're now starting to see our customers hire and onboard new data science teams to go and build a new AI application like the one you just talked about, Chris. And uh, so I'm seeing a, a fusion of those two worlds that kind of lived separately for such a long time. And Calvin, uh, I think that virtualization is, is a great option for that um, because customers already have, you know, such a large portion of their data center virtualized and, and using uh, remote uh, remote uh, connectivity and remote technology, uh, what's to stop people from onboarding data scientists and developers and AI researchers uh, much in the same fashion that they do with their, their engineers and their, their, their traditional end users? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, because so much of this information is going to become uh, so pr proprietary, important, um, potentially sensitive information as well, right? So, you know, having that um, that virtual desktop or that DAS infrastructure layer there for access for security and, and you know consistency, um, reportability, uh, monitoring, things like that. I mean, it, it's a it's a great convergence of you know, really the, um, the the cutting way edge of way of using this information and the cutting edge way of of accessing it and securing um, people no matter where they're accessing it from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, accessing a uh... A Linux virtual desktop built for for data science, right? Uh, yes, Absolutely. maybe a different uh, GPU underneath, maybe a slightly different, um, you know, memory requirements and CPU requirements and things of that nature. But the overall backplane, I think, is becoming uh, more and more standardized for all of these workloads. Um, so I think, I mean, we have about five minutes left, um, which you know we didn't get to any questions, but. Uh, it's actually great to have a discussion, uh, but one of the questions that we did get is around events. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we've been living between physical and virtual, physical and virtual now for you know two and a half years. Um, so uh, I do want to 
kind of uh, bring in Vishal here and, and, and just say a few words about our upcoming events. And, uh, you know, Calvin, if you have anything that you would like to share from a Citrix standpoint or to uh, any type of call to action uh, for people on the line to, to attend informational sessions, uh, please, please go ahead. Yeah, no, look, there are two events, which I would want to just give a plug to is there is SIGGRAPH coming up um, actually next week, uh, August 9th. Um, our CEO, Jensen, he's going to talk about some innovations um, in, uh, for graphics community and, and um, you know, what you can do with, with those applications. But the one which I'm really, really excited about is the one which is our GTC um, um, event coming up in September 19th. And uh, that's the one where we will unveil more innovations, um, more uh, uh, our version around artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and how NVIDIA is making it accessible to even every customer anywhere and everywhere um, to, to, to do these things. So, so if you want to, if you're interested in these technologies, um, absolutely GTC, GDC is the event to go attend. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, if you want to see uh, more case studies like the uh, um, city of Corona and um, uh, other people that are, are putting some um, amazing uh, projects out there and, and innovations and, and how to use um, DAS and, and the rest of the Citrix solutions, um, there is a whole section on our website on citrix.com for that, um, as well as uh, a lot of updates that are coming um, via the, the DAS service. Um, we recently launched a, a new way to kind of keep track of um, new features and, and updates that are being released. Uh, it's called updates.cloud.com. Um, we actually we own the cloud.com uh, domain. Um, so I encourage people to, to keep track of, of all the latest innovations with Citrix by that means. And Calvin, how do you, uh, is there a way to try uh, Citrix Cloud? What's the easiest way for people who've never used it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we do have a, uh, a um, easy kind of seven day trial um, experience to, to get started with uh, sort of some basic um, virtual desktops. You can find that via um, Azure um, Marketplace as well as um, from the Citrix.com uh, site. Great. And Vishal, what about NVIDIA? How do people get to try specifically the software platforms? Yeah, I mean, look, you can you can go to Launchpad and it's easy on the NVIDIA Launchpad and, and you can try out these different models, um, your applications, pre-train them and, and try different things. As well as there is trials for our uh, vGPU again, same thing like on on Azure with Microsoft, and you can try out you know actually all three or four things together with Citrix DAS and GPU technologies and and the Azure Cloud itself from the Microsoft Cloud, and and you can do a deeper dive in AI and ML space with Launchpad, NVIDIA Launchpad site. Great, thank you, Vishal and uh, Chris and Kyle. Um... Any final words, any uh, call, call to action for the audience uh, or any resource page uh, pages that are available from the city of Corona as far as your, your technology? Kyle, you want to say? You go for it. <laughs> so we're always open. My, my, my greatest advice would be to, to just try it. Start small. We did, it wasn't a big bang for us. We didn't transform everything at one time. We piloted lots and we're able to leverage the technology. We reached out to the vendors. I think that's probably one of the biggest, you know, things I could say to the vendors is, is they were there to help us. You know, Citrix was there along the way, you know, Nvidia and Microsoft have been there, you know, with us through the whole journey. And it was just really reaching out and, and asking and building partnerships with them. But we started small, you know, we had to mitigate our risk. And so just start small and, and you know, put your finger in it. And then if, if you need the help from us, Call us. I think me and Kyle are always willing to have those conversations. So, thank you, Chris, and thank you to all of our panelists today. I uh, really appreciate your time, and of course, uh, uh, we appreciate the audience. Um, Rubal, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you for a final word. Thank you so much, Constantine, and again, reiterating what Constantine said. Thank you so much to all our speakers, specifically to Chris and Kyle for taking the time to speak at our webinar. I'm seeing a bunch of questions. I'd just like to call out a couple where they've congratulated Chris and Kyle for their use of AI and specifically the presentation that you showed, Chris. I, I have a bunch of high fives for you on that. So thanks a lot on that. Uh, and, and for our audience, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, every 10th attendee on this webinar will receive a quick email in the next 24 hours uh, if you won that uh, promo prize. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you on the email how to collect your prize. 
will basically ship it to you. Uh, and, and I think that's all. Thanks a lot. I know we've gone a little over and I promise all the questions that we have received, we try and answer them over an email. Uh, so signing off for now. My name is Rubel Walia and uh, see you in another webinar in the future. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.